We're going to go ahead and get started. I would like to welcome everyone who is here with us today. Cannabis use debunking the myths. My name is Councilwoman Tammy Williams, and we welcome you to this informative and fact-filled webinar. I'd like to begin by introducing and welcoming Laura Van Dyke. Laura Van Dyke is our Municipal Alliance Coordinator. She's been serving in this capacity in the Township of West Orange for the past three years. She is a licensed clinical social worker and has also been doing an enormously amazing job with our senior services. Welcome, with no further introduction necessary, Laura Van Dyke. Thank you very much, Councilwoman Williams. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, be a part of this um, workshop today, this, this important seminar. And the Municipal Alliance has been looking to increase our visibility. So it is uh, great to be here today. And I appreciate all of the panelists and, and the support. Um, the Municipal Alliance is, uh, has been a program that has a, a grant funded um, program that we have had in West Orange for about 20 years. So we're working to increase our, our visibility. We're now, we now can be found on the westorange.org um, website under government. Um, and uh, it's stay tuned for more um, public seminars and such from us. So it's good to be here. Thank you, Laura. And at this time, I'd like to welcome and introduce to you our esteemed panelists. I would like to begin by welcoming our assistant prosecutor, William Bill Neefsey, who is the supervisor of the Special Prosecutions Bureau and Narcotics Gang Task Force for the Essex County Prosecutor's Office. He is starting his 24th year as a prosecutor. His unit oversees all countrywide narcotics investigations, as well as handling all carjacking investigations. Since February of 2021, Bill has been the County Marijuana Law Liaison to the Attorney General's Office, responsible for guiding law enforcement through the new laws and regulations. The unit further are the police legal advisors handling all questions from municipal agencies regarding Fourth Amendment and search and seizure issues. Bill is also an instructor at the Essex County Police Academy. And prior to the unit, Bill served as the prosecutor in the Homicide Task Force and Career Criminal Units. Before joining the Essex Prosecutor's Office, Bill spent two years in the Morris County Prosecutor's Office working in the appellate unit. He received his bachelor's degree from Wesley College and his law degree from Loyola University School of Law. After law school, he was a law clerk for the Honorable Walter Barisnek in Union County Superior Court. Mr. Neefsi, welcome. Thank you, Councilwoman. I appreciate you inviting me here. Thank you. And then we have Mr. Joel Torres, ADAPT Senior Manager. He's a graduate of Montclair State University with a Bachelor of Science in Public Health and a master's in public and organizational relations. He is a health education specialist with over 12 years of experience in community organizing, outreach, advocacy, and grassroots campaign. He has also worked with municipal health departments and nonprofit organizations to bring members of the community. Previously, Joel served as an elected representative on the Hudson County Board of Commissioners representing parts of Jersey City and on the Jersey City Board of Education where he served as president in 2017. Mr. Torres, welcome. Good afternoon, Councilwoman. Uh, rest of the distinguished council or panelists here. I appreciate for you the opportunity for you having me on here. We have our next esteemed panelist who you may know so well in West Orange because he is a staple here. Our own Honorable Chief James Abbott of the West Orange Police Department. 
He was appointed as a police officer in 1980, quickly rising through the ranks and was given the opportunity to lead the agency in 1997 and is credited with raising the department morale to a new high level. During his tenure as chief, he has overseen the design and implementation of a volunteer civilian domestic violence response team, two community-based police substations that have been recognized statewide, and additionally, a school resource program that has been developed winning national acclaim. West Orange Police Department is considered a flagship agency by the Commission on Accreditation of Law Enforcement Agencies, Incorporated, C-A-L-E-A. -E Chief Abbott, thank you so much. He is also a member of our Cannabis Task Force here in West Orange, and we appreciate his continued service. Thank you, Chief Abbott. Thank you for including me. I look forward to the conversation and uh, one of many. This is a, a new endeavor for all of us here in New Jersey. And, uh, you know, quite a quite a paradigm shift from you know at one point in my career establishing task forces to go out and arrest people for marijuana and you know come in 180 degrees to helping people open marijuana retail and uh, cultivation sites. So it's been uh, been an interesting time. Indeed, indeed. And last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Teresa Redling who will be joining us. Uh, Dr. Redling is the medal director of CBMC's Geriatric Health and Disease Management Program and the Medical Director of the Sharon and James Meta Geriatric Institute at CBMC. She is a board certified in geriatric medicine, internal medicine, hospice, and palliative care. Dr. Redland joined CBMC in 2012 after holding chief geriatric positions at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York and Newark Beth Israel Medical Center here. Her interests include caring for complex elders, Alzheimer's, and related dementias, and promoting teaching and improving the care for health system elders. Dr. Relling is one of three geriat geriatrician primary care and consultative practice at the Institute and manages her own patients with her team of geriatricians if they require hospitalization at CBMC. In addition, Dr. Redling provides consultative care at CBMC for hospitalized elders, assisting other physicians in best practices for hospital-based elder care. And she also teaches physicians in training, medical students, and many other healthcare practitioners for the art of geriatric medicine. Dr. Redling is the recipient of many awards, including New Jersey Top Docs and Castle Connolly Top Doctors for multiple years, as well as many community awards for best practices in geriatric medicine. Thank you. And now we will begin with a presentation from Mr. Nafsi. I unmute myself, I can actually say that sounds great. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, I guess when we're starting with debunking the myth of criminalization, I, to repeat what Chief Abbott said, this is a sea change for New Jersey, especially for law enforcement from both the municipal police departments as well as us in the county prosecutor's office from what I started with 24 years ago as a prosecutor to where we are now um, in my last four years in my stint as the, the head of our narcotics task force, it, it, it's been a, a complete shift. Um, after, when, and just to, to start, you know, in November of 2020, the electors voted for a constitutional amendment legalizing cannabis in New Jersey. Um, we've become a, a, another state that have allowed that. In the past two years, now the regulations of how to go about doing that have come around. Um, the first step really was in February of 2021 when the Attorney General's office put out all of its rules decriminalizing marijuana. And what that really may, meant at that point in time for law enforcement and for the community at large is that certain, certain offenses that used to be crimes 
were no longer considered crimes. Uh, possession of under six ounces of marijuana, um, possession of drug paraphernalia, um, being under the influence of marijuana, all these things had been uh, criminal charges against people that were no, are no longer. Um, possession of marijuana in a vehicle, which was, was always a big one, distribution of under an ounce of marijuana. These suddenly became, um, for law enforcement purposes and for the regular citizens, these are no longer crimes. And then for the last year, we've been dealing with, well, they're not crimes, but New Jersey was stuck in a very gray area where you couldn't legally buy marijuana in the state. Um, if you possess less than six ounces of it, you couldn't be charged with a crime, but law enforcement was faced with the reality of now what? Um, we were, what we basically had come up with until last week was it, you couldn't have it, so it could be seized, but no one could be charged with it. There was no more criminal charges for the possession of marijuana or distribution for under an ounce. Flash forward, now we go to last uh, Thursday, the 21st, when now everything is legal. And what we mean by legal, cannabis distribution started retail the retail market. And I think people, a lot of people that I had talked to not realizing, they said, what's the difference between cannabis and marijuana? And I said, I'm not really a scientist, but the only, the only difference, they said cannabis is regulated, man marijuana is not. Um, so it's now we're considering if it's being sold in one of the dispensaries, it's cannabis. If it's still sold on the gray market, that will still be probably around, it would be considered marijuana because it's not regulated by the state. So now we come to what New Jersey is facing now with the new cannabis rules and regulations. And there are 13 dispensaries that are open throughout the state. Um, two of them here in Essex County in Bloomfield and Maplewood, and they are authorized to sell cannabis and cannabis related products. The, the biggest thing is that it, it's almost the, the same as I equated to selling alcohol. You have to be over 21. Um, where can you consume it? You consume it in your, in your house or somewhere private. Um, if you can't drink and drive, you can't smoke and drive either. Um, you can't smoke it in a vehicle. And the, the biggest thing I think that people are getting confused on a little bit is you can't take it out of state um, because federally there is still federal crimes about marijuana. It is still illegal to possess marijuana federally. Um, to sell marijuana federally. So people coming from out of state to buy it are stuck in a quandary where you can't transport it over state lines. Um, so that is gonna be an issue that we will have to deal with down the line. Um, but as of right now, what we're faced with, what, what we're faced with in law enforcement on, on the county level and the chief knows on a municipal level is now what, now what do we do? Um, from the county level, we have shifted and we started shifting away the minute that um, the, the constitution was changed and the vote was, was changed, we shifted our investigations more towards other crimes, narcotics crimes that are plaguing our county, basically cocaine and the heroin, which um, are, are destroying our community still. Um, so we have shifted a lot of resources to that. Um, marijuana to sell it out on the street is still illegal over if you sell over an ounce out on the street it is still considered a crime um, if you possess more than six ounces it is still considered a crime out on the streets um, and what's interesting is that you can only buy from a cannabis retailer as i understand it you can only buy an ounce at a time you can have on your possession at any given time six ounces um, anything over six ounces is still considered a crime but under six ounces but you can only possess you can only buy one ounce at a time i don't believe that there is anything in the regulations that say how many different times you can go into a store and buy things um, to make up for that six ounces but at any one time going through one of the dispensaries you can only buy one ounce at a time um, biggest thing that people have been asking me well what can i buy um, I have never been in a store, one of the dispensaries in the last week, nor do I intend in my own personal life to go into one. But as I understand it, they, they can sell certain products 
whether they're in oil form, in gummy form, or in the leaf form um, of different varieties of cannabis. What they can't sell are the edibles. Um, brownies, uh, we've heard about of people selling brownies. Um, there are no, there's no um, kitchens that they have been able to regulate to, to cook these brownies. So anyone who is selling or offering um, marijuana laced brownies, this is still illegal under the law. Um, what is allowed, again, is the, the leaf variety buying that as well as gummies or the oils of what they offer in those stores. Um, biggest change also in the law is how we treat um, over 21 and under 21 um, individuals. There is much more protections of people under the age of 21. Um, they're given warnings if they're found in possession of it, because again, it is illegal under the age of 21 to be in possession of, of marijuana. Um, so, but they're given warnings now, um, if they're under the age of 18, those warnings are also sent to the parents as well. There had been a discussion at first with the first regulations of not telling the parents on the first um, offense of an individual under 18 caught with marijuana, but that was quickly changed um, so that parents are notified as well on the first warning. Um, anyone from 18 to 21 is simply given a warning. Um, they are not arrested, they are not fingerprinted, there is no um, processing of them being taken into custody at any given time. Um, and that is true also for any marijuana offenses at this point in time. There, it's If you're found in possession of over six ounces, and the chief can speak to this as well, um, we're not detaining anyone. They're, they're given a summons and it's mailed to them and they'll deal with it in the courts. But it, it's, it's reduced um, any stain on a person where they're taken into custody and processed and fingerprinted that way as well. I think the biggest change for law enforcement, and again, the chief can speak to this on the, on the municipal level, but is how we interact with the public and searches of vehicles. Um, there was always a, a big thing through the public, um, whether it was an outcry or support of searches of vehicles and finding all sorts of contraband based on the smell of marijuana. What has changed completely in how we train law enforcement officers, how I teach at the academy um, for the Fourth Amendment rights is that the smell of marijuana, if a, if a person is pulled over, the smell of marijuana is not probable cause to search a vehicle anymore. So this has been a, a huge sea change for our local law enforcement partners in retraining most of the officers officers with this is that if they interact with a civilian they, and there's a smell of marijuana, this is not probable cause to search a vehicle anymore. Um, so this has been a, a, a huge change. Um, what has not changed is law enforcement's ability for what we call community caretaking. And that is to watch out for the community at large. So if they do smell marijuana, in a car while they can't search the vehicle, they do have the right to question the driver further to ensure that he is not impaired for driving. Um, this is important uh, because there are no breathalyzer tests for being under the influence of marijuana. Um, all that we have right now are roadside um, observation tests um, that all police officers are trained in. There are some that are drug recognition experts um, it's commonly referred to as DREs that can tell if somebody is under the influence, but police officers are allowed to ensure that the person, if they smell marijuana in the car or observe marijuana in the car, um, they do have the right to ensure to make sure that that person is capable of driving. If they are, they're sent on their way. There's no further search, but if they are found that there is probable cause that they are under the influence where they cannot function to drive the vehicle, um, the police are entitled to arrest them as they would similar to a, a DWI for alcohol use. So I think that is that has been the biggest change um, for law enforcement. Uh, it's, a, it's a new way uh, of doing, doing our job. Um, and and it, it seems to be working at this point in time for the, the last couple of months and we'll see how it's going to go forward. 
we've only been a, a week into the new uh, the new world order, as we say, for where everything is legal and people are, are allowed to to purchase it legally. Um, so I, I think this it's we will see how this is going forward. Um, if there's there's always going to be an adjustment of strategies as we see the data coming in, if we see that there is accidents increasing um, due to, to certain things, we will uh, adjust strategies on the, the local level as well as the county level as we go forward. But it, it's a little bit too early to to predict any of that. Um, you know, we we do have our concerns that New Jersey is one of the most congested states in America. Um, so there's always a concern with too many people being out on the road, but you know, there is no, there's no data to say that because marijuana is, and cannabis is now legal, that there, were, there is going to be an increase in uh, auto accidents. So, but we will adjust accordingly with our um, tactics and investigation abilities as we go forward with this. And I think that about covers um, what the new laws are and how um, how everything is being affected um, so far. I mean, I'd be glad to take any questions as we go along, Councilwoman and, and everyone else, if anybody else has any comments that I can answer or any other questions that I, that I can answer for you guys. I think you're on mute. Thank you, thank you. That was extremely informative and we appreciate all of your knowledge um, and just the, the changes are phenomenal in the decriminalization of cannabis and marijuana. Last Thursday, with the first day of adult use sales in New Jersey, the state's 12 participating dispensaries sold cannabis and cannabis products to 12,438 recreational cannabis customers for a total gross sale of nearly $1.9 million. $1.9 million. Um, so with that, Mr. Nifson made reference to how locally um, this transition has impacted our, and will continue to impact uh, our communities. So Chief, I will now ask you, because we know that the debate around marijuana use is politicized, right? And so there are people on both ends of the continuum, um, beliefs advocating extreme and unsupported positions. While it is a myth that marijuana has no valid medical use, it is also a myth that marijuana is harmless. So we need to keep all of these perspectives um, you know, into reality. We have to understand that there is going to be one perspective, another perspective, and we have to meet in the middle and we all have to remain compliant with the law. Chief Abbott. So to your point, um... Listen, anything that's a mind-altering substance has the uh, potential to be, you know, harmful. Um, but it's kind of common sense, right? Uh, you know, we know that alcohol has its problems. And, uh, you know, the, the one thing the proponents of the legalization of marijuana would say is that, um, you know, not too many people smoke a joint and then go home and beat their wife. You know, alcohol, not so much. It could be quite different. Um, so... Yeah, yeah, on balance, you know, things need to be taken um, in moderation and common sense and judgment has to be exercised to, you know, operation of a vehicle or machinery or, you know, any kind of a safety sensitive position, which uh, you may have seen recently, the attorney general ruled that or opined that um, there's nothing precluding police officers from using marijuana recreationally. I agree with the attorney general's uh, interpretation of the, the statute. Maybe it's a loophole, but that's the case. I think the reason the attorney general did that, and, and I'm speculating here, I have no conversations with General Placken on this, but I think he did it to get the legislature motivated to uh, pass some, some laws that keep certain people that are in safety sensitive positions from ingesting marijuana recreationally. I, I think that was his motivation. And, you know, it makes sense. I addressed this yesterday at our county police chiefs meeting when there was a lot of criticism. And I said, you know, in the general's defense, he interpreted the law as it's written. And I don't think he's wrong for his interpretation. So it's up to the legislature now to do their part. Most police chiefs prefer that they're, uh, 
personnel, not in just marijuana. Um, interestingly, I saw a poll on uh, the news last night that I think like round numbers, two thirds of the population has no aversion to police officers ingesting marijuana recreationally on their own time and so on. The biggest problem with this is, is the testing. And uh, as the prosecutor uh, uh, mentioned that DRE is the drug recognition experts. Um, one of the biggest pitfalls with DREs is that um, wouldn't shock me if at some point in the future, it was a, there was a determination that it was junk science, just as there has been with so many other uh, sciences that are, are used in uh, criminal trials throughout the years that, you know, when they were first introduced, it was the greatest thing in the world. And then a couple of years later, somebody shows that there's no validity to it. One of the foremost DREs out in California just retired. And what we in law enforcement say went over to the dark side. He's now uh, working with defense attorneys. And he is at the forefront of saying that drug recognition is junk science and there's, it has no basis in real science. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to see what, what happens there. But for the time being, um, that's what we have. Um, I can kind of digress to back to where we started at before we had the passing of the law that allowed for cannabis use recreationally. Um, if, I, if I challenge any of you to tell me what New Jersey SNAP is, or even if you Googled it, probably uh, universally you would say the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, which you know gives children lunches in schools and so on from impoverished families. So to a police officer, if I said, what's the New Jersey SNAP? They're going to tell you it's the statewide narcotics action plan. That is a, a plan that any police officer should be um, thoroughly familiar with. And that mandated the arrest of anybody that possessed a controlled dangerous substance. So um, while the police officers kind of get the black eye for all the, uh, the arrests that without question um, adversely uh, impacted communities of color far more than it did um, Caucasians and uh, not, to, not to go off on a tangent here, but again, watching news and uh, 1.9 million in sales. I saw the lines down the block and uh, there was an awful lot of white people in those lines. So that should shatter any myths that, uh, you know, this is used disproportionately by blacks, although blacks and Hispanics are disproportionately arrested for this. But in any event, getting back to the snap that the police officers were, were, were working under, um, you know, I, I always have to remind people when these conversations come up is that a police officer that didn't arrest somebody for possession of marijuana could not only have lost his job, he could have been charged criminally for misconduct and official misconduct. Um, maybe that wouldn't have happened, but it's potential. And there's not too many police officers that are going to put their job at risk, you know, potential to go to jail for not doing their job. So um, that kind of is where we were at pre-legislation. Uh, then um, comes the legislation and uh, ten Attorney General uh, Graywall said to use discretion because the, the legislation and the cleanup legislation and the cleanup of the cleanup legislation wasn't, wasn't enacted yet. So I put something out to our people saying, um, we're not arresting anybody for marijuana unless there are extenuating circumstances. Because I just felt that, you know, the, leaving that discretion, leaving that decision to the person on the street really wasn't fair to them. Um, you know, it was, it was, they were going to be criticized if they did, criticized if they did. So I'd rather be the target myself and say, we're not arresting anybody for possession of, you know, six ounces or less of marijuana, unless there's extenuating circumstances. So that's how we dealt with that. Um, as, the, as the prosecutor mentioned, um, vehicle searches, the, the new people that are in a police academy to be taught this way, that um, before they've even graduated the police academy and future hires, same boat, this is going to be nothing for them because this is going to be the way they've always done it and what they've understood it to be. It's more the people that are here 15, 20 years that, you know, it's, it's a cultural change. It's a, it's a complete paradigm shift to say, listen, this is what we expected you to do at one point, and this is what we expect you to do now. It's, it's just totally different. It's, it's kind of like, you know, de-escalation. These same police officers were taught in the police academy to always press forward, always press forward, which oftentimes uh, is a, an officer-created jeopardy, uh, you know, positions an officer in a, in a position where he may have to use deadly force, where, you know, now we teach to kind of back off. So now we're teaching with marijuana that, you know, the, the smell of marijuana in the car isn't enough. 
just ignore it. It can't even be a factor um, at all. Not even if you're going to charge somebody with driving under the influence, you can't even use that odor of the marijuana as a contributing factor to the probable cause. So it, it's going to take some time and some adjustment, and you know, changing the fabric of law enforcement. But like so many other things, um, it'll all come. You know, when I came on the job and uh, there were people that were here for uh, the Miranda decision, you know, everybody sees it on TV when the people in custody are read their rights. Those officers, you know, swore that nobody would ever give a confession again, we'd never make an arrest again, the world will go to hell in a handbasket. And that didn't happen. I remember when the domestic violence laws came into effect. And, you know, even today, we, we get a domestic violence, we may have two police officers off the road for six hours straight dealing with that. But, you know, you think about the, the lives it saves, it's well worth it. I mean, that is what we're here to do. So, um, you know, it was the same thing, though, my point that people thought that domestic violence laws and, and handling these restraining orders would just, you know, the world will come to an end and we got by it. We'll get by this, you know, um, not many, not many years left in my career, but, you know, for these people that are coming on the job now, like I said, the, this will be second nature to them. I mean, it's just the way it's going to be no different than it was with, with alcohol when I came on the job. I mean, there were plenty of bars and packaged goods stores and, you know, it was totally socially acceptable. This, this too will be, it, it'll come. Um, I think by being on uh, the cannabis task force in here in West Orange, it sort of sets the tone for our department too, that, you know, I'm, I'm a part of this. I'm not apart from it. I'd rather have input to it and, and act in that capacity than be an obstructionist. Um, um, happy to answer any questions. I'll be here for the duration and thank you for uh, including me in this. Thank you so much, Chief. And I do want to acknowledge and highlight and bring to everyone's attention um, just that last statement that you made, that you're a part of the change in West Orange. Mm -hmm. You're not on the outside. And we absolutely appreciate your direction and your guidance um, and, and making everything in West Orange uh, come into a reality. So we, we appreciate your service. We appreciate your input. And we thank you. Thank you. So we, we know that we've seen a tremendous amount of pro-marijuana messages dominating um, the internet, well-organized campaigns promoting marijuana's medicinal uses, decriminalization and legalization is, are constantly making the headlines. Um, there's this urgent need to change the myths and support and sanction marijuana use by providing accurate scientific information and working to change the attitudes of youth parents, influential adults, doctors, nurses, educators, journalists, and the broader community about marijuana. Um, with that, we're going to transition to Dr. Redland so she can provide us the medical information and debunk those myths as well. I am going to welcome and spotlight Dr. Redling. One moment. Can you, there you go. Hello, everybody. So I actually have a slide set. I'm, I'm a practicing geriatrician and my, I am actually registered to certify people for medical marijuana use and have taken upon myself to educate myself on the appropriate uses for medical marijuana. And uh, so I'm gonna give you some of the scientific basis, how it works and uh, a little bit more medical information. If you put my slides up, please. Absolutely. Thank you. One second. Always a little bit of te technical difficulty when you don't expect it. Right. I can talk from, I have my slides. I think um, I'll get them up momentarily. Okay. Okay, so I actually can start while you're trying. Go but ahead. I am. Um, so a few years back, actually, I give a, a, a symposium, educational symposium every year at, at now Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center. And 
about four years ago, I gave a talk called Caring with Cannabis. It was amazing how well it was uh, received and a lot of people participated in because everyone is really um, was extremely interested in, in using the use of cannabis um, medicinally and otherwise. Um, I can't, let me see. Okay, here we go. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, it because people really don't fully understand, I think, the difference between CBD and THC and all those other abbreviations, as well as um, the other components actually that are part of marijuana. Something going on here. Ah, oh, yay. Okay, there we go. Okay, so you can go on to the next slide if, if you would. So <clears throat> the class, these class of medicinal products that are found in the plant, and cannabis is the proper term, are called phytocannabinoids. And you can actually see the, the found in the highest concentration in the resin, which is the sticky part, which is secreted actually by the female plant. So it's the female plant that they actually harvest. When, when plants are harvested to, to take the, um, to sell for uh, medicinal or recreational use. And it's primarily found in the bud or the flower of the plant where, where when I was younger, I mean, people used, they used the, um, the leaf and all other types of the parts of the plants, but the most concentration is actually in the bud or the flower. And now actually you can buy um, cheaper products medicinally or, or uh, recreationally, they call that the trim. That's not the bud part, but just as an FYI. So there, um, these are the most abundant cannabinoids that are found within um, the marijuana. And that's THC, and cannabidiol, which is CBD, which you can buy that separately, right? You can buy that over the counter. And that's actually in the highest concentrate in the hemp plant, which is not, um, has a very minimal amount of THC, it's less than 0.3% of THC, which is the psychoactive part of cannabis. Uh, you could buy CBD and you can actually get medical grade CBD from dispensaries as well. And then you could see there's a whole um, host of other products within that that actually provide the medicinal benefits for individuals that use this for medicinal purposes and also um, obviously contribute to the recreational part of it is um, this, the um, psychoactive piece as well. And there are other pieces, you can see active flavonoids, terp terpenes, they actually uh, contribute in a lot of ways. They, they give a different smell and different flavors and things like that. So it's actually a pretty complicated thing. You can move on. Um, so you may be aware that we have in our body, we have something in endogenous, meaning within the body, we have an opioid um, endogenous opioid system, meaning the receptors that respond to opioids that are either, and, and as you may know, opioids are plant-based as well. They um, come from the opioid plant initially, uh, and then are processed to different synthetic types of opioids. But we also have a, an endogenous cannabinoid system, and there are different receptors in all different parts of our body that we can help explain scientifically why do we feel the way we do when we ingest or, uh, and I'll talk about the different ways that you can actually consume cannabis, but you can see um, CB1 receptors are primarily the brain, lungs, and in, in, in your arteries and veins and your muscles and your GI tract and your reproductive organs. And then CB2, CB, uh, CB2 are present in the spleen and bones. And then, um, so these receptors are all over the body. And that's basically why um, you could get a variety of responses to medicinal marijuana or recreationally. You can go on. And so what's the difference between how we respond and the effect on the body? So plain old cannabidione is not psychoactive, meaning it doesn't make you feel high. Some people can get a little sedated with it, but generally um, it, it really doesn't have many psychoactive effects. And actually it's used to offset some of the psychoactive effects of the THC in cannabis. So we'll talk about a little bit about um, dosing and things like that and how we dispense it. And it's actually doesn't bind very well to those receptors throughout the body. But one thing that's, that's important is that it's a potent inhibitor of certain enzymes in the liver that metabolize our other drugs. So some people will say like, oh, you know, it's completely harmless, including the CBD, you know, you can even buy CBD, you can buy in a grocery store. 
um, it may not be a good quality product, but you can buy it. Um, and it, but it, it can definitely have an impact uh, medically and clinically because it could affect your body's metabolism of other pharmaceutical drugs that you may be taking for other medicinal purposes. And then the THC side is, that's what has the psychoactive effect. It, it stimulates the um, CB1 receptors in the brain, less so for CB2. And it's metabolized to a, a very highly active um, component through the liver when you ingest it. You can uh, go on. So here's the uh, clinical effects that we see. And you may be aware that CBD actually for quite some time actually has been processed to, to um, be provided for a very rare seizure disorder in children. So that's been available for quite some time over you know, a couple of decades. Epidiolex, is, that's a CBD. So it does have an anticonvulsive effect. The THC more has a muscle relaxant. You can see that's the psychoactive piece. Um, CBD also has kind of an anxiolytic, so some people use it for anxiety, THC less so. Uh, THC is, is generally more sedating than the CBD, and, and then there could be some um, uh, negative side effects, including a fast heart rate, it can raise your blood pressure a little bit. Appetite stimulant, a little bit for THC. Some people always think about, you know, when, when you use cannabis, you get the munchies, and I've had some patients say they want to take cannabis to, to stimulate their appetite to gain weight for people you know, that are advanced age and with other medical conditions where they need to gain weight, but it doesn't really work that well for that in particular. And it has some other more positive effects of CBD as an antioxidant um, for you know, more diffuse inf inflammation and things. And that's why it may be used for more for musculoskeletal conditions. You can move forward. So these are the uh, medical approved uses for medicinal marijuana. And you can see the main ones that are used in, in bold, but uh, some neurodegenerative diseases like ALS. The most common reason why I would um, uh, certify somebody for medicinal marijuana use would be anxiety and chronic pain. So for uh, severe arthritis or people that have uh, progressive neurodegenerative diseases, their spine, but you can see all of these uses that it's appropriate migraine, multiple sclerosis. It is actually approved also for opioid use disorder. And so that for that would be an individual that is dependent on opioids and you're trying to get them off opioids, you can actually substitute medical marijuana and try to taper them off. Um, but as an aside, I actually have had a patient who uh, was definitely an opioid abuser. He was in his mid to late 80s and he used way too much oxycodone. And then he substituted medical marijuana, you know, as a drug of addiction as well. So there's that, and which I could speak to briefly about that. So you have to be cautious with this as well. Uh, terminal cancer, uh, muscular dystrophy, various inflammatory bowel disease, people that are on hospice and terminal, terminal illness. Um, and then medication-resistant glaucoma, and, and then AIDS-related um, pain, nausea, or um, cachexia wasting syndromes. Next slide. So you do, you're supposed to, you're supposed to have a relationship with patients in order to certify them for use, at least in the state of New Jersey, and, and meaning, a, a, and they, they say a bona fide relationship with a physician. Uh, there are some physicians that actually will charge you to certify you, and but that's you. I mean, I don't charge my patients anything. It's a part of their care. If I think it's appropriate that they that they should have medicinal marijuana, then uh, it's a pretty simple process to register somebody, and um, I don't charge them anything. So you should be aware of that. I mean, um, as a patient, if if your physician is not uh, registered to certify you that there are, you, you can generally find um, some qualified physicians that may do that for you. And there should really not, I don't think there should be a fee attached to that. It's part of my medical care. You have to be a New Jersey uh, resident and then be qualified by one of those uh, diagnoses that I uh, showed earlier. Next slide. So this is what it looks like when I certify you. I actually go online um, to the New Jersey Medicinal Marijuana Program and give you a diagnosis. 
the maximum amount that I can give you on a monthly basis is three ounces. And I'll speak just briefly how, how do, um, do they dispense it in the dispensary as far as um, use. So you can either inhale it, you could vape it, or you could smoke it, or you can ingest it. Um, and now this is separate from recreational, but this I think pretty much is, is what's going to be available at this point in the dispensaries for recreational use as well. Edibles generally are lozenges and things because they, they are very specific about how, what milligram doses of THC and CBD is actually in that edible product. In oils, tinctures, which are extracts, um, you can use it topically in creams, gels, and patches. We don't recommend smoking it. Smoking is bad for you and smoking marijuana is bad for you too. So next slide. Um, so when, when we prescribe for pain, then you try to initiate somebody on a long acting uh, product. And you usually you have to take it two to three times a day because it doesn't stay in the system any longer than that. And it's generally recommended that you use CBD and THC in a one-to-one -one ratio because with not enough uh, CBD, the CBD offsets some of the psychoactive piece of the THC. So most of my patients that, that use marijuana medicinally, they don't wanna get high. They, well, they want pain relief, they want treatment for their anxiety. So um, the CBD helps to offset that. And most um, of the bud tenders or people that are dispensing this in the dispensaries, they're called bud tenders, um, they usually start you at a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, and then you can make adjustments by the different strains and you're going to work with the dispensary on that. So once I certify you, then it's out of my hands. You go to the dispensary and then you discuss with the bud tenders your condition and they'll make a recommendation what type of strain, um, what strain is appropriate for your condition. And sometimes people use a different strain in the morning than they do at night because they may want something a little more sedating in the evening. Uh, one thing that's important is if you ingest it, it takes up to an hour for you to feel the effects of marijuana, whether it be recreationally or um, you know, medicinally. And this is really important because people may redose themselves. Now, most people will just fall asleep, but um, this is particularly important for those that, that are, are frail or certainly when it gets into the wrong hands of children or teenagers, that they could take a whole bunch of this ingestible stuff and you won't see the full effects for like an hour or more. So that's really important. You could actually see here, I pointed out when our bodies metabolize this, the metabolized product is 10 times more powerful than the inhaled THC. So that's really important when you talk to people about ingesting marijuana, whether they do it for recreational um, uses or whether you do it medicinally. Um, and then you, you gradually, if you're going to do this for opioid cessation, then you're going to gradually um, decrease their opioids. That's a whole other thing. Next slide. So in summary, uh, I said that you use the CBD to reduce the psychoactive effects. You can actually initiate treatment initially right away in the beginning with just CBD. And then the, the dispensary can change the strain and add more THC as needed for the patient's condition. And the, and the individual really should be working closely with the bud tenders and the dispensary. Um, next. So I just want to, this, this, um, these are uh, a little bit about the ethical stuff with medicinal marijuana. And I guess you could extrapolate that to recreational as well. For pro marijuana, people think that it's safer than alcohol as far as um, ingesting it, it's clinical, it's, it's uh, effects on the body as far as uh, complications, side effects, long-term use and things. And some people think it's, it's more natural and it's a safer treatment for chronic pain. And then uh, there, there is a little bit of literature that supports that it may be useful for people with Parkinson's disease, for example, for spasticity. There's a big question there for Alzheimer's disease. There's not a lot of literature. Um, cancer and multiple sclerosis. And, and they are actually are studying this pretty extensively. There's a big program at Temple where scientists uh, basically study, that's what they do. They study uh, marijuana and uh, they study it from a scientific perspective as well as in clinical trials and things like that for uh, management of certain medical conditions. Uh, some people think that it's, um, it's certainly um, less addictive than other products that we prescribe pretty readily like opioids and benzodiazepines, you know, like Valium and Ativan and things like that. 
And then it's been used for a very, very long time with positive uh, results. The next slide. And then those that may oppose marijuana use, um, that it actually has been shown that frequently using too much marijuana is no good for your brain. You know, that can cause short term memory loss. And that certainly if it's used in younger individuals, it can impact normal brain development. So this is not something that should be used randomly for particularly for developing brains. Uh, and uh, and needs to be done by somebody that that really has the skills and the knowledge to do so. And then and then some people do question, is there enough evidence that it does really work for pain relief that it should be used medicinally? In my experience, it's it depends on the individual. It's, it's very variable um, how well it works. But I have some patients that say that it works tremendously, even at a very, very tiny dose. That they haven't had to use any other pain medication for their underlying condition. Some people think that because it's going to be more readily available, and this is definitely true, it's like alcohol, like some of the other speakers said, that it, children will have easier access to it. And it, it could be uh, particularly damaging for young, young individuals and kids, so you want to put that stuff away, lock it up. Um, it does carry a risk of abuse and addiction for those that have a predilection towards that. As I said, I had this one patient that replaced his opioid addiction with uh, cannabis addiction. And he came in the came in the office with his pipe and and uh, and actually offered offered me a hit and things like that, you know. So <laughs> there is a potential for that. Some people think chronic use may lead to lower quality of life, health problems. It's expensive. The stuff is really expensive. If you go to the dispensary, they don't take credit cards. They don't take checks. The the medical dis, medical marijuana neither. I mean, it's a cash business. They take um, uh, you know, like a bank card. Uh, and they have ATMs on site. Um, and some people think it's just an excuse for legalizing uh, another uh, uh, drug that potentially is a drug of abuse. So that's all I have. And I'll stay here too, to answer any questions from a me medical or scientific perspective, if I can. Thank you so much, Dr. Redling. That was extremely informative. So we appreciate all of that information. And lastly, we bring to you, Mr. Joel Torres. Mr. Torres, give us and share your perspective. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon. Thank you, Councilwoman, for that uh, information, the introduction, and uh, for all of the rest of the panelists. Uh, I'm coming from this perspective from a prevention side of things and a, for a prevention conversation. Uh, we've been working diligently throughout the entire county of Essex, um, along with our, our great partners like Chief Abbott, uh, when it comes to the discussions around the prevention of substance use and how to support individuals who might be dealing with substance use disorders already. Uh, so I appreciate the conversations from the assistant prosecutor, uh, from Chief Abbott and from everyone else on, on the panel discussing uh, the myths and kind of not going from the scare tactics perspective. Uh, somebody with a background in public health, it's important when we have conversations with our community, especially with youth, to understand that scare tactics do not work um, fear-based messaging does not work uh, because that hurts when we're trying to provide in individuals with information backed by science and data. Uh, it hurts us because we're seen as just feeding into that fear and feeding into that false narrative. Uh, just very clear understanding. We should not have to be told this, but we should know it already. Uh, our, our kids, younger generations, they have these devices on them. They have computers on them. Uh, so very quickly, they can fact check us. And if we're if we are not telling them the truth or we're trying to scare them, they will fact check us and they will know that we are not a trusted source. And if you're a parent trying to educate your child uh, coming from a fear based perspective and then not becoming that trusted source we will guide our children to other sources who might not be trustworthy themselves, but they don't have that that stigma or that label of being the parents or being the adult and they might be a trusted source. Um, so before I, I move on, I do want to also say that Chief Abbott, uh, what was mentioned already, uh, I want to wholeheartedly state that uh, the chief is not just talking the talk, he actually walks the walk. We've had the pleasure of working with Chief Abbott for the past six or seven years now in various levels of prevention work, uh, especially as it comes to the opioid use uh, epidemic that is happening throughout our entire country here in our county and uh, in our local towns. Uh, so Chief Abbott is at the forefront of the efforts of not just 
looking at ways uh, that or issues the way they are, but looking at innovative ways to support the community and make changes. Uh, so when it comes to this new conversation regarding uh, adult use cannabis, and uh, I'm, I'm shifting away from the recreational use, and I like to appreciate the fact that others have, have called it adult use, uh, just because I'll give you a quick tidbit from our prevention conversations already. There are individuals who are calling their local towns and their recreation departments to find out information about recreational uh, cannabis. That's not, that is not something that is sold by your town. That is not something that is sold by uh, local government entities. As the assistant prosecutor mentioned, uh, there are locations that are licensed now. There are only 12 locations currently, but different towns are going through the entire process. So the towns are, or the licensed establishments are allowed to sell these products to adults over the age of 21. Uh, while you're when you're purchasing that uh, you can use as the assistant prosecutor stated at your private residence but if you do uh, rent or if you do not own the property just be aware that uh, property owners do have the right to prohibit consumption of cannabis on their property there there are there are uh currently uh the laws do allow them to control what's used and what's utilized on private property as it pertains to smoking or consuming cannabis products in public, uh, please be aware that the these products are listed and utilized just like any other smoking products that are used or vaping products that are used. Uh, so they do fall under the Smoke-Free Air Act. They are not allowed uh, to be consumed in public places or workspaces. Uh, that includes public transportation, uh, that includes your public beaches, your public parks, theaters, uh, parking facilities, et cetera. Uh, there are confusion. There is confusion as it pertains to uh, the older population, because as we stated, uh, this is something for adults over the age of 21. Uh, but college students who are 21 or older, and unfortunately some college students under the age of 21 who are, are still using, think that it is okay to use on campus, and it is not. Uh, the campus uh, does have the right to enforce, uh, and we have various campuses here in Essex County. They do have the right to enforce the laws because they also have to follow the federal laws, not just the state laws. Uh, as the assistant prosecutor stated, at the federal level, this is still not legal. At the state level, it is different. So just be aware of that. Uh, the parental part of things, um, Chief and the, the assistant prosecutor mentioned the, the cleanup of the cleanup of the cleanup. Uh, there were issues at the beginning as far as notifying parents. Uh, so if a, a child gets caught with uh, marijuana, cannabis, whatever way to define it, uh, they do have to notify the parent the first time. Uh, if that same child gets uh, caught again a second time, there is uh, a recommendation for treatment services for the child. Uh, the third time, there is a mandatory requirement to send that child to local treatment services. So there is something um, required in state law. Uh, be aware, as was already mentioned, you cannot uh, use cannabis products and drive. It is treated the same way as uh, alcohol or consuming alcohol. Um, your workplace, your establishments where you work do have a right to control uh, the way that they do things with uh, their rules and regulations when it comes to cannabis. Uh, so just because there is mention of the attorney general uh, discussing as it pertains to uh, officers and off-duty work does not mean that that might pertain to your workplace. Each workplace, private workplace, has their own rules and requirements. You are not allowed to grow uh, your own cannabis for personal use uh, currently as the law speaks. And of course, anyone pregnant or breastfeeding should not be consuming uh, these products. Uh, I do want to close with just saying that we have a lot of uh, organizations or entities at our le different levels that work on prevention, early intervention, treatment, etc., uh, your local alliance here, Laura, uh, does an amazing job with the alliance, but the, the resources that we have for the work that we do are very limited. Uh, so we're seeing this new market come in. We're seeing all of this talk come in. Uh, but when it comes to prevention, when it comes to uh, trying to reduce the early onset of substance use, which we see with alcohol, we see, uh, unfortunately right now, the cases of young individuals using substances to deal with stress, to deal with life, uh, post-pandemic has gone up uh, precipitously throughout, especially with the younger populations. We're seeing roughly about 14% of children between the ages of 10 and 14 are already participating in what's called binge drinking. That is drinking at least four or more uh, drinks of alcohol within a two-hour setting. 
Uh, so at a younger age, children are already dealing with uh, using substances. So this is something else to add to uh, the work that needs to be done, but the resources are very limited. Uh, Laura can speak to the alliances and the, the, the very small amount of funding that they get to do a lot of work in West Orange. Um, we work closely with the County uh, of Essex, uh, with the Division of Community Health Services, with the County Alliance Program. Uh, we've developed a countywide cannabis task force to kind of look at this and, and collaborate with our local towns and our local partners. Uh, so just be aware that uh, it's very important work. Uh, people forget about, about prevention and the importance of it, but every dollar that's spent on prevention actually saves you about $6 in healthcare uh, costs or health costs in general over time. So it's very important to, to try to stop things from happening before they start. Um, so with that said, I'm, I'm here as well for any questions or any other guidance that I can give. Thank you so much. This has been an absolutely informative uh, workshop, Lunch and Learn. So I wanna thank each of our guests, uh, Laura Van Dyke, Municipal Alliance Coordinator. Thank you so much for just uh, giving us an opportunity to share information to our community. Um, I think we are in agreement uh, that the, the best way to educate the public and to make sure we're clear on the direction that the township is to go is to just make sure we're all educated, understanding uh, factual information. So again, I thank you um, for this opportunity. Uh, Chief James Abbott, thank you so much for always availing yourself whenever I call and ask. Um, you are absolutely one of the most respected members of our community and we thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Dr. Redling, your information, thank you so much. Again, just the medical background is what we all are yearning for. That information is critical to understanding how we are going to transition into this new space. Assistant Prosecutor Neepsi, thank you so much for kicking us off with the transition in the law and making sure we're clear on what expectations should and should not be met. Thank you so much. And Mr. Torres, from a prevention standpoint, we all know that whenever any type of abuse it can happen, an ounce of prevention is always better. So thank you so much for sharing and telling us about the resources that are available, the community resources, and for your continued support as well. Laura, um, is there are there any closing remarks that you would like to share as well? Yeah, me. There are two questions in the chat. If if you if you'd like to, yep. We'll take a little bit of. We'll take just a little bit of time. We did promise to end at two at two o'clock. Right. One question is: Now that cannabis is legal in New Jersey, is it taxed? Absolutely, it is. That is why it's it's taxed heavily regulated. Um, there's a municipal tax. That was one of the the rationales for West Orange as a community. Um, to engage in this new product and opportunity um, is because it does benefit the municipality um, financially. Absolutely. This is New Jersey. You never have to ask the question, is it that? <laughs> and then will this be posted for the public who was not able to participate today? It, it will be posted. It is. Um, it was Facebook Live on um, Tammy Williams for West Orange, and we will get that uploaded on the uh, municipal webpage um, quickly. So for all those who took the time out to join us, I hope you enjoyed this information as much as I did. This is always going to be an opportunity for us to learn. Uh, we thank you for your time. And if there are any in information we have not been able to answer, please feel free to reach out to Laura Van Dyke at the Municipal Alliance. Um, her email information is ldyke at westorange.org and you oh, can also oh van dyke oh van dyke at westorange.org and we'll make sure that information um, is available on the website as well thank you everyone we appreciate your time thank you tammy all righty bye-bye thank you councilman take care everyone here have a good one